Welcome back to Module 4. In this video, we're going to be discussing the solar interior and following the highlights throughout Chapter 16 of OpenStax Astronomy. So, a bit of background for us as we start this section. One of the key things, one of the key ideas in physics is that there are certain quantities that cannot be created or destroyed. Angular momentum is one of them, and that explains a lot of the dynamics in our solar system and the orbits that we have. But another really key quantity that cannot be created or destroyed is energy. This statement is called the conservation of energy, so it's a conserved quantity. And so when we see the sun sending out light and heat, it cannot create that energy out of nothing. There has to be a source for it. If we think about anything that we use in our everyday lives, if we think about um, our cell phones, for example, the battery slowly depletes and we have to plug it in to charge, which means we are spending money on the electricity coming from our outlets in order to put that energy back into the battery. If we were to light a campfire uh, when we're out visiting the UP and um, we have wood and that wood turns to fire and flame and warmth, we are turning the wood into the light and heat that we see by burning it. So if the sun is shining, we want to know what the source is. Is it burning something like our campfire? So maybe it's like a coal furnace where as long as we keep sending it something, maybe comets, that it can continue to power itself. That was an early idea for what powers the sun, but a fairly straightforward back of the envelope conversation uh, um, calculation by astronomers rules that out. There would have to be far too many comets um, being thrown at the sun to keep the, uh, the coal furnace itself kind of burning. So we had to rule that one out. Another possibility is that if over time the sun is kind of slowly crunching down on itself, maybe it's turning gravitational potential energy into that heat and light. That is something that Jupiter is actively doing. Jupiter kind of gives off more uh, heat and radio energy than it receives as energy from the sun. And if we think about uh, kind of holding something high in the air and dropping it, it immediately starts moving because we're turning gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. So again, something that we can kind of think about for our everyday lives, but the sun it doesn't work for. If we were to try to think about how much smaller the sun would have to get over time to be as hot and bright as it is, uh, it would have to noticeably shrink over the time period that um, scientists have been looking at it. And so we don't see that shrinkage. It's not um, contracting that way. So uh, the final option for us that we're going to talk about a lot more in the next couple of slides is nuclear reactions. Now the key thing is when we talk about a nuclear reaction, we're taking some element and we're turning it into some other element. And throughout that process, um, protons and electrons and neutrons are kind of being manipulated in order to hopefully get energy out of the situation. There are plenty of nuclear uh, reactions that require energy in order to happen. Uh, but if we're talking about a power source, we need it to produce energy rather than use it up. And so what, what do we mean then by a source of energy? Here we uh, have Albert Einstein helping us out here. If we can turn some of the mass of the sun into light and heat, mass is actually a way to store energy and the amount that we get out of it comes from Albert Einstein's most well-known equation, E equals mc squared, where the c in that equation is the same speed of light c that we learned about in chapter 5. And so the energy that we would get out depends on how much mass we're using up. So basically what we want to figure out is what is happening as a nuclear reaction inside the sun that has less mass at the end than it did at the start, because that leftover used up mass becomes energy. So there are two main types of nuclear reactions. Fusion, where we have multiple small things coming together to make one big thing. And we have fission, where we have one big thing breaking up into several smaller things. Now, one way that we can try to kind of put this into our heads to remember is the word fusion has one S, it has one big end product. 
the word fission has two S's. It has multiple end products. If that's helpful, great. If not, at the very least, we got to write it down. We got to make sure that we can tell the difference. We have technologies on Earth that use fission, the nuclear reactors that um, have been power plants in the past um, and continue to do so, use fission of um, very high number elements. And um, both types of nuclear reactions, fusion and fission, have been used in uh, weapons. So the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb used fusion, the A-bomb, the atomic bob bomb used fission. But what we're really interested in is something that is sustained and safe um, and not just one big event like a bomb would be. Stars are able to power themselves through fusion, and it is a long-term goal in um, the field of, of energy generation on Earth um, to be able to do fusion in a sustained and um, useful way to get energy out of the process. So far, we're not there, um, but the kind of, even though the goalpost keeps shifting, we get closer and closer to it over time. You can find articles in science magazines from many, many decades ago that say we're 30 years away from fusion. And uh, those same articles today might say that we're 10 years away from um, fusion and as a viable source of, of energy generation on Earth. So we're getting there, but we are not there yet. Now, for us to understand the process itself, we do want to remind ourselves of some of the basic components of the atom that we talked about already in um, Module 3. So protons have a positive charge, they're found in the nucleus. Neutrons have no charge, they're also found in the nucleus. And then electrons have a negative charge, and they're in the electron cloud. Um, and if we're just talking about hitting nuclei together, the electrons aren't part of the process. They're just kind of gone. We want to introduce two new particles to help us understand what the different things coming out of these, equa um, these equations and reactions are. So all types of matter, all particles that are matter, have an antimatter opposite particle. There are protons and there are antiprotons. And there are electrons and there are anti-electrons, antimatter electron equivalents, and those are called the positron. They have the opposite charge as the electron, they have the same mass, and they have a lot of the same characteristics, except they're antimatter. When matter and antimatter um, find each other, they uh, equally annihilate, and instead of having those particles there, we now have pure energy in the form of photons. And then neutrinos. Neutrinos are a really interesting particle because they were invented before they were discovered. And what we mean by that is when there were a whole bunch of different nuclear reaction experiments happening in the 1950s, there were several experiments where when we kind of counted and measured what was going into the reaction and we counted and measured everything coming out of the reaction, we had a problem because it seemed like energy wasn't being conserved, that there was less energy at the end than at the beginning. And this is one of these like core tenets of physics is that these conserved quantities have to be conserved. So Wolfgang Pauli suggested, invented this kind of placeholder particle where because we weren't observing it, it can't react with normal matter. And, um, it means it can't be producing light. We would uh, notice that. It can't really pr be producing much of a um, gravitational pull because we'd be able to sense its mass. And it definitely can't be charged because we'd be able to measure that in those experiments. So he came up with this term, neutrino, uh, kind of a spin on Italian for a little neutral one, which was a neutral particle like the neutron but with very little mass. His original idea was that it was massless so that it could move at the speed of light the way photons do. So kind of like a photon, except photons are really great at interacting with matter and neutrinos wouldn't be. Over time, we figured out ways to detect neutrinos, which we'll talk about towards the end of this video, but it turns out they are quite necessary for our calculations to balance out and to work properly. Okay, 
So I'm going to describe the steps of the proton-proton chain on this slide. You don't have to write all the steps down. I just want you to see them um, to understand that the sun isn't following a clear recipe. It is just smashing literally everything it has together all of the time. <laughs> so we talked about the fact that the sun is 75% hydrogen, three quarters hydrogen. If we think about what a hydrogen nucleus is, it is a single proton. So the most common thing that is going to collide in the core of the sun will be two protons because the sun is simply full of these protons. So this is what would happen when two protons collide with each other. They hit each other. Um, one of the protons in that collision, in order to have a stable end result, has to go from being a proton to being a neutron. And so we get this kind of glued together mass with one proton, one neutron. We'd have to call it hydrogen still because it's still element one on the periodic table. In order to serve, conserve charge, we have to have a positron come out. We couldn't have another proton because then mass would be coming out of nowhere. And to make sure that the energy balance is appropriately, a neutrino comes out of this as well. That happens in general when a proton becomes a neutron. So this first step is happening constantly. It is happening in the sun more often than it needs to. It's just creating a whole bunch of these um, H2 um, atoms, the isotope of hydrogen that we often call deuterium. And we could just sit and watch that happen over and over and over again, and it will be. But every so often, because we're starting to build up this deuterium, the hydrogen 2, that will get hit with another proton, a new proton, because there's just a lot of it flying around in the core. When that happens, those are able to just kind of glue together, and we get a helium-3 nucleus. And the way that mass works down at the atomic level, um, even though it looks like there's two protons and one neutron on each side, that binding energy has an effect too, and we actually get some energy out of the process. We get a gamma ray, high energy photon, but we know that photons are light, that's just light that's leaving. So we can hit together all sorts of different things. We can try to throw another proton at that helium-3 nucleus. It doesn't stick. Uh, it's just not a stable thing. And so the last stable step, the last step that actually makes some progress and happens a considerable enough amount that it matters, is that two of these helium-3 nuclei find each other. They smack together, and for a brief moment, they will make beryllium with the four different um, protons, but that falls apart almost immediately. What does come out of the process as a stable end result is a helium-4 nucleus, the most common and most stable type of helium, and then two bonus protons on their way back out again. When we look at what we would need for that third step, we'd recognize, hopefully, that we need two of the first step and two of the second step. So if we tracked everything that we went that we added to this, we put six hydrogen atoms in, but two come out in the final end result. And so the thing that we do want to write down in our notes relevant to the proton-proton chain is that four hydrogen are turning into one single helium nucleus plus some bonus energy. The bonus energy is coming out as gamma rays, neutrinos, and positrons. So the positrons, as soon as they find an electron, they will hit each other, annihilate, and create new photons. The photons are going to start to move out of the sun, but as soon as they hit an atom, they'll get absorbed and re-emitted, and they'll do that in steps. We'll come back to them. And the neutrinos are also created, but they don't interact with anything, so they just kind of leave the sun in all directions. This slide here on the right side has a kind of completed process of all of those steps that better shows what I meant by the first two steps have to happen twice each to give us enough things to make our end product. Certainly, if you want to write it in your notes, you can. You can pause the video, but it is not required for you to have that level of detail in your understanding. The highlighted statement on the slide is the level that we, that we need to understand. Okay, so we saw this figure in a previous video, but we didn't really talk about the interior of the sun. We said the core was about 20% of the volume. That's still true. And the core is the only part of the sun that is dense enough for the steps that we just talked about to actually happen. 
So above the core, we have two different zones. We have the radiative zone and the convection zone. And those two names are telling us what is happening to move the energy. In the radiative zone, the energy is radiating outward. So all of those photons are kind of streaming outward the way that heat streams out, of, um, out in all directions from a campfire. And then the convection zone is when hot materials physically brought to the surface and cold materials brought back down again. We briefly mentioned that when we talked about the photosphere's granulation pattern. We compared it to boiling a pot of water on the stove and the water kind of moves around in the pot. So let's look at the details now of each of those zones. In the radiative zone, we can talk about the fact that photons stream outwards, but they don't actually. They get reabsorbed and re-emitted in lots and lots of steps, and then there's going to be this kind of statistical number of steps it takes them to leave, which means two different things. One, the more steps that they're stuck in the sun, the more energy they slowly lose. And two, when we think about the energy being formed in the core of the sun, we have to come to terms with the fact that it might take a million years for some photons to make it from the sun's core to the sun's outer surface, the photosphere. And after a million years of bouncing around, then it only takes eight and a half minutes to get from the sun all the way to the earth, which is just a little mind boggling. Now, neutrinos don't have this problem. They don't stop for anything. So in both of the pictures, the one on the left that was the photons to begin with, um, and the new left side of the image where the photon is being shown as this random walk, that's still showing far too few of steps, um, but it's kind of showing that it's, that it's this kind of random pattern where if you had to take one step in a random direction, like you rolled the dice to see what direction you moved and you're trying to get across the room, it could take you 10 steps or it could take you 10,000 steps. The neutrinos just zip out of there. So we'll come back to the neutrinos, but for now, they're gone. <laughs> for the photons, this radiative zone is so ineffective at bringing the energy out away from the core that at some point convection is able to take over instead. And that specific point has to do with the temperature gradients and the pressure gradients. There's a lot of detailed physics that goes into when that is a more effective process. But at some point when we're talking about the convection zone, Below that is that radiative zone where energy is kind of trying to escape, and then when it makes it to the convection zone, the physical plasma moves up and then back down again, where it brings hot plasma up and colder plasma back down. Whenever we're at any location throughout the different layers of the sun, there is a very clear balance between the inward pull of gravity the force of gravity that we talked about in module three, and the outward push of pressure, where any hot plasma or gas is trying to push um, from the hotter location to the colder location. So there's this tug of war between gravity in and pressure out. This tug of war is stable, and it means that the sun has been stably doing its thing for five billion years, and that stability has a term that we definitely wanna have in our um, vocabulary because it is so essential to the way that stars evolve over time. So that term is called hydrostatic equilibrium. Pause if you want to um, because this slide, the bolded text, is describing the balance of the two highlighted statements. So pause to write it all down if you haven't. Um, I strongly encourage you to to have a note in your notes that this is relevant also to all of module five coming up. But this balance between gravity pulling in and pressure pushing out tells us that the sun is stable and it describes what happens or it helps us um, kind of model what happens when we get things that become red giants because they're expanding, something is winning, pressure, um, or we get these cool things called black holes that we've all heard about before this class because gravity won, gravity beat the balance and we're going to talk about why that is uh, later on. So, when we look at the whole solar interior, we mentioned the fusion is happening in the core, the kind of inner 20% of the um, volume of the sun. Then the radiative zone extends out to about 75% of the radius out to the um, edge of the sun. 
and the convection zone takes over from there. You don't have to memorize or write down these, um, these plots, but what I do want us to recognize is the temperature has to be very high to have fusion occur. And we can see that it's dropping off stably as we go from the blue to the orange to the yellow. And also important, besides having high enough temperatures so things are zipping around, they have to zip around and hit each other fast enough, which means they have to be close enough together. The density has to be quite high to have fusion occur also. So that bottom left plot is really showing us the big reason why fusion is not happening in the outer layers is the density drops down very, very low. By the time we get to the photosphere, what we kind of call the surface of the sun, even though it's not a solid surface, the density is similar to the air in the room that you're in right now. It's just hotter, but um, it isn't a solid surface of any kind. We just can't see past it, kind of like a cloud on, a, um, on an otherwise sunny day. You can't see past that cloud, but you know that the cloud's not solid. Now, the word luminosity in the upper right plot we will introduce ourselves to that word, word in more detail in later slides, especially in module five. But that is describing the rate at which energy is being generated. We can see that um, throughout the whole core, especially that inner 20%, we are creating energy throughout that whole volume. But once we have that energy, it just moves. There's no new energy being added in the radiative zone. There's no new energy being added in the convection zone either, not from any outside source. And then this bottom right one really is kind of a foreshadowing to what we're gonna be talking about in module five with the evolution of stars. Because I told you that the sun was um, a quarter hydrogen, 75% hydrogen. And what we can see is where we are doing fusion, we are taking away that hydrogen and replacing it with more helium. So instead of being 75% hydrogen in the core, we're slowly using up our fuel tank. At some point in the future, 5 billion years, at some point in the future, we will run out of hydrogen in our core and the sun will not be able to continue stably doing what it's doing um, because its fuel source will be empty. We will talk in module five about what happens uh, in that future, future phase. So as we kind of wrap up our discussion with these last few slides, uh, I want us to recognize that there's a lot of described about the solar interior, but we cannot go and, and visit there. We can't see any direct um, images of the solar interior. And so you might be wondering, how do we know anything about it? And that's a fair question. It's also a question that we might at some point in our past have asked about Earth. How do we know anything about the layers of the Earth that we learn about in school with the core and the mantle and all that stuff? Um, on Earth, we use earthquakes and the different types of seismic waves that get created travel differently through different densities. And so it kind of creates this map of the inside of the earth. The same kind of thing is true for the sun, but rather than having to wait for a specific sun quake, the sun is actually always vibrating in a very particular set of patterns, and that set of patterns is directly related to how the density changes as we go deeper and deeper. So there's a whole field of astronomy called helioseismology, which is the study of the interior of the sun using these vib vibration patterns. And what they're able to be looking at is the Doppler effect on the surface. So this image is kind of color coded red and blue. Um, we had talked about in module three about red shift is when stuff is moving away from us, blue shift is when stuff is moving towards us. And so we have this overall pattern that based on how that looks on the surface of the sun, we can actually figure out deeper, um, deeper structure. This is true in a general sense, but it is also true that the Doppler effect can actually help us figure out the structures in and around sunspots, the densities um, around these regions. So kind of cool. And then the other thing that helps us study what's happening in the core of the sun is by actually trying to track down those neutrinos that have just been escaping in all directions. So Raymond Davis Jr. is shown here on the left, and he went out trying to solve the solar, um, 
trying to look for solar neutrinos. And what he found instead was a problem. So Raymond Davis Jr. Um, got the funding to build the world's, um, one of the world's first solar neutrino telescopes. Now, um, it would be very interesting to have been in on the meetings where he was getting that funding because in general, his idea was we are gonna fill a giant tank with cleaning fluid and put it underground in an abandoned mine. And you think to yourself, well, that is the weirdest idea ever. It works though, because since solar neutrinos are not really interacting with anything much, they'll just kind of move through the entire planet, they'll move through empty space, they'll move through everything without slowing down, except every so often, if they run into a already kind of unstable um, atom, they will be able to kind of kick off a reaction. So the cleaning fluid was a cheap way to get a whole bunch of chlorine atoms, where every so often solar neutrinos would um, go through that tank and one neutrino might interact with one atom in the tank and create a reaction that then made some light, a single photon that was measured. So already a kind of crazy um, experiment to begin with, but the really big thing that uh, happened was ex almost exactly one third of the expected number of neutrinos were um, found by this experiment. And one third is a big difference from expected number to result. When we have an experiment that doesn't match our model, in science, we have to figure out, do we need to change our model? And um, some of the time, our experiment might be a little faulty. So um, there are times where we wanna double check our results, but the experiment here did exactly what it was designed to do. It was designed to look for the type of neutrino that the sun makes, and it found a third of the number it expected. So fast forwarding, um, because the story isn't fully necessary to our curriculum goals, it turns out that the sun does only make the one type of neutrino that we expected it to, but because those neutrinos have a tiny bit of mass instead of being perfectly massless, they can actually have a specific behavior that um, wasn't expected where they can transition between the three different total types of neutrinos. So it's kind of like if instead of a coin, which only has two sides, we had like a three-sided coin or a um, three-sided dice and we tried to roll it and every single moment these neutrinos were, were just bouncing around to whatever we rolled. So that by the time they got to Earth, a third were the type that the tank could find and the other two were secret and hidden because they weren't gonna interact with chlorine atoms to begin with. So that new hypothesis led to updated, um, updated models and updated uh, machinery. So it took 30 years to build new experiments uh, and those got built both in Japan and Canada and those new experiments were designed with heavy water in order to try to find all three types of neutrinos. So heavy water is water, H2O, that has a lot of deuterium, the extra neutrinos attached to a hydrogen atom. Uh, and they will find all three types of neutrinos. It worked in both countries, uh, and so the 2002 Nobel Prize went to Raymond Davis and colleagues, the 2015 Nobel Prizes went to these two experiments that followed up with that, uh, and we learned a lot about solar neutrinos by having a failed experiment. Failure can lead to a lot more learning than just getting it right the first time. So I think it's a really neat um, overall uh, example of the scientific method at work. Uh, and it is the reason that we know a lot about those nuclear reactions is because our, our theories have been able to be supported by a wide body of evidence since then. So that's it for chapter 16. That's it for our detailed discussion of the sun. And we'll see you in the next video for a discussion of other stars. Thanks for watching.